Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. And this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Today we are studying Leviticus chapter 4. Mercy is God's first response. In this chapter, we come to the third kind of sacrifice addressed in the book of Leviticus, the sin or the trespass offering. We've looked at the consecration offering, the peace or the covenantal offering, and now we come to the sin offering. Mention is made in this chapter of sinning and ignorance. How does God deal with sin? God's response is always to extend his mercy and to provide through shed blood the means of returning to fellowship and relationship with him through the work of the cross. Even as God's first response to sin is going to be mercy, even so our first respond response to sin should likewise be mercy. It's Leviticus 4, 35 verses. Let's read it together and then continue on with our study. Chapter 4, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a, if a soul sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them, if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, let him bring for his sin which he hath sinned a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the Lord shall and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the congregation. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all of the remainder of the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall take off from it all the fat of the bullock for the sin offering, the fat that covers the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. As it was taken from the bullock of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar of burnt offering. And the skin of the bullock, and all his flesh with his head and his legs, and his inwards and his dung, in other words, to be burnt. And even the whole bullock, shall he carry forth against the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him upon the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out, shall he be burnt. And if the whole congregation of Israel sin, if the entire nation sins uh, through ignorance and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning the things which ought not to be done and they are guilty, when the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. So we see that God is dealing with the sin of the individual, the sin of the leadership, and the sin of the nation. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord, and the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to the tabernacle of the congregation, and the priest shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord, even before the veil. And he shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar, which is before the Lord that is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and then pour out the rest of the blood at the bottom of the altar 
of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. You can see by reading this that the uh, dressing of sin was a very uniform matter, whether it was for an individual, for a leader, or for the nation. And he shall take all of the fat from him and burn it upon the altar, and he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for the sin offering. So shall he do this, and the priest shall make an atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven them. And he shall carry forth the bullock without the camp and burn him as he burned the first bullock. It is a sin offering for the congregation. When a ruler other than a priest has sinned and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord his God concerning the things which ought not to be done and is guilty, or if his sin wherein he hath sinned come to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before the lord it is a sin offering and the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all his blood at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering and he shall burn all of his fat upon the altar and the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings and the priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven him. And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he does somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning the things which ought not to be done and be guilty, or if his sin which he has sinned come to his knowledge, then he shall bring uh, his offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, for his sin wherewith he has sinned. And he shall lay his head, his hand on the head of the sin offering and shall slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. And the priest shall take of the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. And he shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat is taken away from the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord, and the priest shall make atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. And if he brings a lamb for a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish, and he shall lay his head upon the head of the sin offering, and slay it for a sin offering in the place where they kill the burnt offering. Remember, they killed the burnt offering on the north side of the brazen altar which faced the tribe of judah where they encamped which was a pointing to the fact that the offering that would be slain ultimately would be jesus of the tribe of judah the lamb of god as john the baptist proclaimed and the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar and pour out all the altar the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar and he shall take away all of the fat thereof as the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of the peace offering. So we see the connection between the sin offering and the peace offering. And the priest shall burn them on the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord, and the priest shall make an atonement for his sin that he hath committed, and it shall be forgiven him. So we see the connection of the peace offering, the uh, act of atonement, which means at one minute God is making us at one with him through what? The universal shedding of blood. So verse 1 of our chapter opens up addressing the issue of sinning in ignorance. Now, the statement here goes way beyond ignorance of the law is no excuse, because even though they sinned in ignorance, they had to bring a blood sacrifice. What it, this establishes for us is that morality, right and wrong, out, exists outside of ourselves, outside of whether we knew better, outside of we were doing our best. Uh, there's something in human nature that excuses ourselves by different uh, predicates. Uh, we didn't know. We didn't know better. We were doing our best. Uh, you don't know what I've been through. All of these excuses that are made for sin that are relative to the person committing the transgression. 
the broader term we use to describe this kind of thinking is subjectivism. Subjectivism maintains that there is no objective truth. Go out and stand up for your truth. That's your truth. No, that's if it's your truth, then it's a lie. There's only one truth, and that's the truth of God's word. Uh, there is no, they, uh, subjectivism maintains that there is no objective truth or accountability higher than the perception and judgments of the individual. That situation, if ethics apply, that morality is a question of personal choice rather than eternal truth that every soul is answerable to. It's the idea like I was trained in the military. They trained as I'm okay, you're okay, and stay out of everybody's business. That kind of thinking arises from a viewpoint, a humanistic viewpoint that assumes that God does not exist and that personal opinion and perception is the highest authority. Does the Bible support this kind of relativistic thinking? Let's read a couple of scriptures. Paul makes a statement regarding this in two passages we're going to read. The first is Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Paul said in Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Whether we know what you've gone through, whether you knew what you were doing or not, whether or not we were doing our best, all have sinned. In Romans 5.12, wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death is passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So we see that sin is not just something uh, based on an act. Sin is a state we are born into. Sin is not just what we do, it's who we are. And only the shed blood of Christ can address that. We can draw from these passages and others that sin exists and accountability for wrongdoing is universal. Whether you choose to believe in the Bible, objective truth, or any authority beyond personal choice, accountability is something that we all fall under. In verse 3, we see God dealing with the sins of a leader, of a priest serving in the tabernacle. Here again, the concept that would have been uh, uh, foreign to ancient peoples uh, because leaders tended to exempt themselves from wrongdoing as leaders do today. But politicians in this country, if they apologize, that's political suicide because we have a mentality that leaders can, should and can do no wrong. But this passage uh, belies that, saying, look, when the leader sins, blood must be shed. No one is exempted. The priests mediated sin on behalf of the people by administering animal sacrifices that were brought to them. So they mediated sin for the people by animal sacrifice, but they were not exempted from accountability for their transgression. What does that tell us? That tells us that privilege does not mitigate responsibility. Those in authority often adopt a do what I say, don't do what I do attitude. In this country, uh, it's a fact that privilege purchases justice. Uh, most of the people that are in prison today are those living far below the poverty line. Those that have means and wealth can purchase their justice with their money. But what this is telling us is privilege cannot purchase justice, only the shed blood of the sacrificial animal representing the shed blood of Christ that applies to the nation, to the priest, to the leader, to the individual, equally. So it's duplicitous to think that because you're in authority that uh, those rules don't apply to you. That's duplicitous. The heart of hypocrisy is holding others accountable to a standard that we don't apply to ourselves. In fact, Paul said when we hold someone to a standard, it's because we know the standard and have transgressed it. That's what Paul's taught. Um, let, let me give you an example. As a young pastor, I had a group of people in my church who smoked. They invited a young Christian, a new to the church, to their prayer meeting. They had a prayer meeting every week and just so happened most of them smoked. They didn't announce it as a smoker's prayer meeting, but it just so happened most of them smoked. And uh, this young Christian also smoked. and He's new to the group. And uh, he attended for many weeks. And their custom was that 
everybody would go outside and have a cigarette before prayer, and then they would adjourn inside for prayer time. One day, after everyone had had their cigarette outside, they all came inside to pray, as was their custom, and the they brought the 16-year-old boy of the uh, mom and dad of the house in front of the group who had been caught smoking himself that day. So they all smoked. And they caught the 16-year-old boy smoking. And so all of these smokers gathered around and proceeded to attempt to cast a demon of nicotine out of the boy. Now, is that hypocrisy or not? This completely, and I'm not speaking on the morality of smoking. It's I'm addressing the attitude. This completely scandalizes this young convert who saw the hypocrisy that none of the others in the group saw. What is the message? Nobody is exempt from God's law. In the book of Romans, we read in Romans eleven thirty two, it says, God has concluded them all in unbelief. In that case, they were all smokers. They had no right to try and cast a demon of nicotine out of somebody when they were carrying the same chain. Uh, God has concluded all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all, Paul says. In verse 6, we see the role that blood serves to expiate the sins of the worshiper under the Old Testament economy when he brought a sacrifice for sin. He was not appeasing God. He was expiating his sin. The priest would dip his finger in the blood and he would sprinkle it seven times before the veil of the sanctuary. Now, seven is God's number of perfection, meaning that the blood was the entire solution for sin and not any other thing. We cannot offer to God balancing good works to make up for the difference of our evil deeds. Only the blood suffices to expiate our guilt before God. Now, God's manner of dealing with sin does not prescribe justice, but redemption. We want God to adjudicate for us. We get this teaching in the courts of heaven. We need to be, be aware that we're not asking God for uh, justice. We're asking him for redemption because in the filter of the lens of God's justice, we're all guilty and we deserve punishment. The blood of the sacrifice represents Jesus dying, taking our punishment for our transgression. We don't bring God our good works. We don't bring him our good intention. We don't claim ignorance or give excuses or justifications uh, before the just judgment bar of our own conscience. We bring the blood of Jesus. The blood was sprinkled before the veil leading to the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Now, the picture is obvious. Notice that they didn't shed the blood on the door going out of the tabernacle. They shed the blood going in to the inner sanctum of the tabernacle. The shed blood is not so we can go on our way. The shed blood, living lives of self-direction. The shed blood of the sacrifice, rather, is the opposite. It opens the way for us to come into a deeper intimacy with God. That is how God deals with sin by making possible for us to come into a deeper relationship with him. He brings us into his presence. And when we see him, we become like him. And then sin is dealt with. We see him, we become like him. And this is what John wrote about. John maintained in his first letter that the blood brought forgiveness and led us to God's presence where we are forever changed, thus showing that God not only forgives, but he wants to bring a cessation of sin. The Christian life is never intended to be an endless cycle of sinning and being forgiven. Now let's read John, 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, verse 2, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when we shall appear, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So God expiates sin by his, the shed blood of the cross, in that he might bring us close to him, and we are changed, and sin ceases. In verses 11 through 21, we see that once the sin offering is made, we got to do something with the ashes. 
The ashes of the offering are taken out of the camp and disposed of in a ceremonially clean place. The ashes represent the image of Jesus being taken off the cross and laid in the tomb. He's paid the price. He became sin for us upon the cross. He is now taking sin away from us, thus rendering us acceptable in God's sight. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, we read that God made Jesus to be sin for us. He knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So what does God do with sin then? He takes it out of his sight in order to establish with us an unbroken relationship. The psalmist put it this way in Psalms 103 verses 12 through 17. Let's read it together. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Why? So we can go out and sin again? No. Remember the sprinkling that removes our sin as far as east is from the west was a sprinkling into the Holy of Holies, not out of the tabernacle to go on living our lives as we see fit. Verse 13. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him by bringing them close to him that we might be changed and become like him and cease from sin. Verse 14, he knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passes over it and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of God demonstrated in the shed blood of Christ, not sending us back out of the tabernacle to live our own lives, but drawing us in closer to him. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness is to children's children. Verse 13 in our chapter of Leviticus 4 establishes that not only can an individual sin, but a whole nation can sin. Notice the repeated mention of sinning in ignorance, sinning in, in ignorance. We tend to point the finger at all sin and we accuse the offender of saying, you knew what you were doing, but there is a higher perspective that comes from the heart of God's mercy. Remember the words of Jesus upon the cross in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. So he's addressing, he's literally offering up the sin offering described in Leviticus 4. And of course, they go on to part his raiment and cast lots for his raiment. It didn't matter what they were doing. It mattered what he was doing. Paul echoes this sentiment in 1 Corinthians 2, 8. And he writes this. He says, none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known what they were doing, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So even those who cried out for Jesus' death and those who drove the nails in his hands, had they realized the cosmic role they were playing, would not have done so. But even though they had sinned in ignorance, they still needed the shed blood. Now, this is the perspective of God's mercy. Therefore, we must likewise extend the same mercy to those when uh, we are tempted not to forgive. So we see that sin exists and that the shed blood of Christ is the only remedy for our guilt. We also see the universality of sin and the singular prescription for dealing with sin that it applies to everyone equally, and that's the shed blood of Christ. If the priest sins, he shall bring an offering. If the ruler sins, he shall bring an offering. If the common man sins, he shall bring an offering. If the priest sins, he shall bring an offering. And it's not a grain offering. It's a sacrificial animal. Shed blood. Sacrificial blood is the only solution for sin. The grain offering has its place. It represents bringing our works to God. Uh, this was the difference between Cain's offering and Abel's. Abel's offering was accepted because he was offering atoning blood in acknowledgement for his own need. He knew that his mother and father were naked and God slew animals to cover them. And therefore he's slaying an animal and bringing sacrificial blood in acknowledgement of his inherited accountability to God. 
Cain bypassed all consideration of this and his need of a savior, his need to be covered. He offers a grain offering. Here, God, take what I can give you. As though he could negotiate with God without acknowledging his own lost condition. That's why we must repent of our sins when we accept Jesus. We can't just come and say, oh, yes, Jesus, I know you love me a whole lot. Well, I'm going to let you love me. No, we have to acknowledge our sin and the blood of Christ as the expiation for our sin. Performance-based religion or a performance-based approach to God <clears throat> denies our need of a Savior and rejects the Lordship of Christ in our lives. Performance-based religion is appeasing God so we can go on our way. But the shed blood is offered and it draws us toward God, not licenses us to go away from God and live lives of self-direction. So in order to correct these, these mis misapprehensions, God gives us the law. All of these sacrifices echoing what Christ has done for us. We exhaust ourselves trying to solve our own problem on our own until we collapse at the foot of the cross and finally confess we have need of a Savior. So, in the shed blood of the sacrifice, representing the sacrifice of Christ, we are accepting, we are expressing our faith, not in ourselves or what we have done, but in who Jesus is and what he has done for us. We are not bringing to God our best intentions or our accomplishments. We are throwing ourselves upon the mercy of the court of heaven, appealing not that we were ignorant or giving excuses, but just offering up and accepting Jesus as our high priest, sprinkling the blood in, in the place of access to God, not sprinkling the blood so we could say thank you very much and head out the door and live lives as we see fit. The power of the blood, nothing but the blood, only the blood can atone for our transgression. Father, we thank you for the shed blood of Calvary. We thank you that you didn't leave us without remedy from sin. We ask, Lord, that you would deliver us from our thinking that we could ever move you by pleading our victimhood, by trying to be good little Christians. You don't want our grain offerings. Grain could never be offered for sin, only shed blood. We accept the shed blood of Calvary, not so we can go on our way. We accept the shed blood of Calvary that we might enter in deeper into relationship with you. Amen.